My name is Pastor Don Curtis from Victory Faith Center in Modesto, California. And I am teaching on the subject of the value of God's Word. The value of God's Word. I've uh, uh, taught on uh, God's Word endures forever. And so we don't ever need to think about the Word quitting on us. <laughs> it's always going to be there. It's always going to have its full power and ability to do what God said it would do. And then we talked about uh, the Word provides detailed instruction for each one of us so that you and I can uh, receive information out of God's Word no matter what situation or circumstance we're involved in, you know. We can... Uh, get the information out of God's Word. And I might mention here, you know, that when you pray, you have to go into God's Word. If you're going to pray a prayer of petition, there's many different kinds of prayer. And some people think that every prayer has to have, I, uh, you know, whether it's God's will or not. Well, God's Word is His will. <laughs> and so if you're praying a prayer of petition or requesting something from God, it's as simple as this. You go in the Bible and find where God said it. Preferably three different places. And then you have it a cinch. <laughs> and you can say, Lord, I found these three places. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established, right? And so I found these three places that says, for instance, let's say on healing, uh, Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, by his stripes you are healed. Matthew 8, uh, 16 and 17, he healed them all that it might be fulfilled that uh, by Isaiah the prophet spoke, you know, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And then we go to 1 Peter 2, 24, where it says by his stripes ye were healed, putting it in the past tense in uh, the New Testament. And so there you have your three witnesses for healing and uh, you can't fail on that type of praying. So God's Word provides detailed instruction. And then we talked about uh, God's Word uh, purifying our lives. And so we need to know that uh, the Word of God will sanctify us. Sanctify means simply to set us apart for a holy use unto God. And God has, you know, things that He can have us to do. Each one of us are uh, personally and uh, divinely equipped by the Lord, however we were designed and everything about us, uh, to do a certain thing that God wants us to accomplish. So don't try to do somebody else's job. Do whatever your job is, <laughs> you know. I found that it's so uh, much easier if I just stay in my office and I don't intrude in someone else's office. Now, my wife is more evangelistic and, and she'll, uh, sometimes when I'm teaching and I uh, give too many points on something, trying to get the, that point across, you know, she'll say, well, why can't you say it in less words, you know? Well, that's an evangelist. That's how they think, see? And so I have to understand where she's coming from, you know, and that's her office and that. And so uh, I don't let that offend me. I just do what I'm supposed to do, <laughs> you know? And I know that sometimes I have to repeat it several times before people will get it. There's a rule of thumb on teaching. It said, if a person's been taught wrong, if they've been taught wrongly about anything, uh, it takes 12 times of teaching on the same subject just to bring them even so they can begin to start to take in the truth. And so you have to get rid of the negative before you can get into the positive, right? There used to be a song years ago called Eliminate the Negative and Accentuate the Positive. Remember that song? Uh, you know, I don't know if it was a good song all the way through, but that part's good. You know, eliminate that negative and get into the positive and, and God is very positive about everything. So today we're going to talk about God's Word will allow you and I to see His view concerning us. We can begin to see how He sees us. His view concerning us. 
And one of the best scriptures that I've ever seen in the Bible is found in Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 28. Beginning with verse 28. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. It said, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Well, that's all, every believer. <laughs> we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And, you know, to get into the kingdom of God, first off, you're going to have to love Him. Uh, there's no problem on His part in love. Because the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Say So that's uh, John 3.16. You all should know that. Now, so we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And uh, it goes on to say, To them who are called according to His purpose. So each one of us is called to God's purpose. Number one, he's given every believer the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and so forth, you know. That's what uh, all of us are supposed to do, go out there and preach that gospel and minister to people. When we see people uh, that are in need, minister to them, right? As much as you can. I'm being a teacher, you know, and knowing what I know, many times uh, what someone will say, well, you, I want you to pray for this person or I want you to do this or that, you know, and I say, well, first off, we need to find out if this person wants me to pray for them. And secondly, we need to find out what they believe. <laughs> See? And the you know, the people will stay there and nod their head. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Pastor. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so you have to, what I call, locate people before you pray for them. Like when I would go in and pray for people in a hospital, uh, you know, some people believe in anointing with oil. So you better bring your little anointing bottle <laughs> in there, have it in your pocket. You don't know exactly what everybody's going to believe in. Some people believe in a prayer of agreement. These are different kinds of prayers. And so you have to find out what they believe in, and then uh, you can pray that prayer that works. Now, I prayed, uh, I was talking to a lady one time that we were leasing a house from, and I went through the different kinds of prayer. And when I got to the prayer of agreement, she said, that's it right there. She said, that's how my husband and I got all of our properties. So they own several properties. And so she, uh, she had cancer. She's in the hospital. Her and I uh, prayed a prayer of agreement. And God lifted her up and healed her. And she came. She had j- just lifted our rent. <laughs> and she said, well, the Lord told her to bring the rent back down. <laughs> so... That prayer paid off, didn't it? (laughs) Paid off for her and it paid off for me. (laughs) See? So it goes on to say, For whom he did foreknow, he also did uh, preadventure, or predestinate, pardon me, preadventure. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Well, there's a lot in this one little scripture right here, this little text. But just to simplify it, that we're supposed to be just like Jesus. And Jesus, you know, uh, he could have came and died and, and not left any example on earth. But no, he left examples on how we should minister. And some people say, well, Jesus ministered, you know, as the Son of God. Well, no, the Bible said... He laid aside his deity and uh, it said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Now, how do we know that for sure? Well, we don't see anything that Jesus did until he was 30 years of age. Well, why would it wait until he was 30 years of age? Well, it was when he was 30 that the Holy Ghost came on him. The Bible is very clear about that in Luke. And uh, so we need to know in Luke chapter 4 that 
that's whenever the Holy Ghost came on him and he began to uh, operate in the power of God. Right? And so uh, he came here to redeem us, spirit, soul, and body. And he came here to train his disciples and to have it all written down in the Bible so you and I would know how to be a disciple. And a disciple means a disciplined one. Now, being in the Marine Corps, I fully understand that uh, word there. <laughs> and so, uh, some of you people maybe have never been very disciplined. <laughs> uh, I remember talking to somebody one time, and, and uh, I'd heard an old-time minister said, I can uh, uh, tell you how, uh, if, how disciplined a person is if I just walk in their bedroom and open up their chest of drawers and see if their clothes are folded inside the drawer." Or if they're just thrown in there and crammed in. Or look in their closet and see if things are crammed in and crammed in here and there. Or if everything's in line. Being in the military again, <laughs> I mean, if the captain came by and he wanted me to open my footlocker, when I opened it up, uh, it looked like a display in Dillard's. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was in... Everything was perfectly in place. Every one of my t-shirts and socks and everything was marked with my name on it. You know, and you never know when they wanted to do that. So I have an advantage over most people. <laughs> but anyway, uh, getting back to the lady, I kidded with her. You know, I said, well, when I was uh, doing something at her house, you know, I said, well, I, uh, you know, I looked in there to see how your chest or drawers were. And she said, Don, you didn't, didn't you? You didn't. <laughs> well, you know, I said, no, really, I didn't. I was just kidding with you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that is foolish jesting. <laughs> but, hey, uh, you know, we, again, you know, we need to know that uh, we need to practice being disciplined and everything in our life. My wife and I, if we're driving down the highway, and we're doing it every Sunday now, and... People buzzing in and buzzing out and cutting right in front of you and everything. And, you know, and it kind of makes you want to be upset. And I explained to her, I said, what they practice, down the line, they're going to get caught at. <laughs> See, if you practice driving safely, well, anytime you're caught, you're going to be in a safe zone. Mm -hmm. Not them, because their practicing is lawless. <laughs> See, so eventually they're going to get caught. We were in West Virginia going down the freeway and this car was just right behind us. And, uh, you know, whenever uh, we went to senior driving school later, we learned that anytime somebody comes up and starts tailgating you, just move over and let them go, you know. And but in this case, you know, the person buzzed around the right hand side of me, went around the truck, went back over and way down the road in front of me, you know, and I told my wife, I said, someplace down the road we're going to see that car with the front end smashed up. Well, it wasn't 30 minutes later, and there's a car pulled off the side of the road, the whole front end smashed up, and smoke coming out of the, you know, the, under the hood. Well, why? Because of their bad driving. See? So we're going to be like Jesus. And Jesus, you know, he was very disciplined, he was disciplined in prayer. He was disciplined in time with the Father. You know, he absolutely didn't do anything unless it concerned the Word. Uh, according to John 5 and 30, Jesus said uh, he didn't say anything or do anything unless the Father told him to say it or do it. And so that's how we have to be. These are examples in the Bible for you and I to follow, and Jesus is the absolutely flawless, perfect example to follow. Now, in verse 30 here, it said, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. <laughs> well, <laughs> again, we got another scripture that's just loaded with information. It, first it says, uh, them he, uh, the, who he predestinated, you know, in other words, knew that we're coming in, God 
is all-knowing, you know, so he knows who's going to accept Jesus and who's not going to accept him. This is not predestination, meaning that some are going to be saved and some are not going to be saved no matter what. No, it doesn't mean that at all. Every one of us have to make a decision whether we're going to accept Jesus. The gospel is for all people, for all nations, for all nationalities. And it's for until Jesus comes to get us, okay? So we need to know that all things uh, are for everybody. Now, here he says, uh, them he also justified. Well, justified means made righteous. This is God's view of us. God's view of us that is that we have right standing with him. And how did we get that? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that uh, Jesus became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took our sin and he gave us his righteousness. The Bible tells us in Romans that it is a free gift. Amen? It's not something we earned. It's not something that uh, we can work for or anything. Uh, right standing is a free gift from God. And Jesus paid for it in full. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say, Whom he justified, he also glorified. And this has been controversial for years. <laughs> you know, because there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, God will not share his glory. Well, they don't understand the context there on that scripture because that uh, scripture pertained to the idols that they were worshiping in those days, right? And so he's not going to share his glory with other gods and other idols and all of that. But here it said, whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, I want, I want you just to hold your place there, but I'm going to read very quickly out of John 17. John 17, uh, verse 20, it says, Neither uh, pray I for these alone, this is Jesus speaking, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, talking about the disciples there and adding us to the list. And verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now look at verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. How about that? The glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. Well, what is the glory? Well, the glory is the manifest presence of God. You see, the Bible said we've all sinned and come short of the glory. But over here in Colossians 1 and 26, it talks about even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generation, but now is made manifest to his saints. We're talking about a manifestation of God right here. And in verse 27, it said, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, watch this, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm just going to stop right there uh, on that part. But I want you to understand that God does share His glory with us. Why? Because, number one, He breathes His life into us and we become new creatures in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away. All things become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 And then uh, we receive His Holy Spirit. Well, <laughs> The manifestation of God in the Holy Spirit that was in Jesus, that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, lives in us, according to Romans uh, 8 and 11. Let me see that said, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. 
So that spirit is dwelling in us. Amen. That's the glory of God. That's the manifest presence of God. So we're no longer short of the glory. We're not all sinners saved by grace, are we? We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Amen. We're talking about how God views us. We're talking about how God sees us. And how does he see us? Through the blood of Jesus. Amen. And we look good through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Any other way, we wouldn't look so good. <laughs> but through the blood, we look good because we are clean through the blood. And we are clean through the word. We learned that last time. Now, in verse 31, he goes on to say, What shall we then say to these things? This is uh, uh, Romans 8, verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now this is how God sees it. If God's for us, who's going to be against us? See? Who's going to take God down? Well, the devil couldn't take him down. And there's nobody else around that uh, is any bigger than him. You know? And so uh, that means nobody can take God down. See? So what shall we say about these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And then he tells us why. Verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Wow. Look at that. And then in verse 33, it said, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Right? God that justifieth, not man. It is God that justifieth. Verse 34, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So, here we see that, you know, Jesus not only has redeemed us, but he has become our lawyer. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the one that made us righteous, remember? Verse 2, And he is the propitiation or the redemptive sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You got that? He is actually our lawyer. <laughs> See? He's our lawyer, and he stands for us. When we see and understand Jesus as our lawyer, and God the Father as the judge, <laughs> we got it working for us, don't we? See? But out there in the world, if people have never received Jesus, never accepted what God has provided for them in the salvation of His Son, well, you see, they don't have that provision until they receive Jesus. Once you receive Jesus, all these wonderful things comes with it. It's a big package of wonderful things that God sends with salvation. Number one, uh, so many times we talked about the word salvation means deliverance, safety, preservation, healing, wholeness, soundness of mind and body, plus eternal life. It means all seven of those things. And so that all belongs to us the moment we receive Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we have wisdom, wisdom, <laughs> uh, well, let me just give you the scripture in uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and 30, I believe it is. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and 30, it says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who, it, who of God is made unto us wisdom. Got that? And righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, all four of those things. He's made unto us wisdom, and Jesus is the wisdom of the ages. Amen. And He, by His Spirit, lives in us. And there's the righteousness again. There's the sanctification. And there's the redemption. 
See, so all four of those things belong to us at the new birth when we are born again. Again, we're talking about God's word allows you and I to see his view concerning us, how God sees us. And I want to, I want to put it a different way. God wants you to begin to see yourself that way. <laughs> he wants you to begin to see yourself the way he sees you, right? If he sees you that way, well, you don't want to come against that. However, God sees you. He sees you perfect in Christ Jesus. The Bible there said uh, in one scripture, you know, see every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Well, what does that mean? It means perfect. <laughs> it means the man on the inside. We're not talking about the flesh that has to be presented to God according to Romans 12, 1 and 2. We're not talking about the... Uh, the mind that needs to be renewed by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Amen. We're talking about the spirit man on the inside is perfect. See? And so that's how God sees us. He sees us perfect. Now, Romans 8, 35. Romans 8, 35, it said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. And of course, sword uh, has to do with war and that, you know. Verse 36, As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, verse 37 again tells us how God sees us. Nay, or no, we're none of that. We're not any of that. We're not sheep accounted for the slaughter. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, you know, the naysayers, you know, they would pull out all that negative stuff and say that's, that's how God sees us. No, no, he doesn't see us that way. He sees us through Christ. He sees us through the blood. Amen. He sees us perfect. He sees us the way His Word says He sees us. If you want to know how He sees you, you look into the Word, and James calls it uh, the, like a mirror or the perfect law of liberty. See? It's a mirror that reflects who you are in the natural, but you see, that's the natural man. But the Word is a mirror that reflects who you are in the Spirit. See? That's what James is saying. So when you look into the mirror of the Word, it reflects back to you who you really are. And you see, you're not what you used to be. <laughs> and some people, some family members and old friends, you know, that never accepted Christ and that, uh, they'll bring up old things concerning your past, you know. But you're a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 You're now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 You know, I'm just going over this, reiterating it. So it just registers on your mind and you can begin to see yourself how God sees you. That's what's important. See? The Word allows you and I to see how God views us, how He sees us, and He wants us to see ourselves the way He sees us. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Now, verse 38, He goes on to say, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nobody, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Now, when we come into that love, we come into that love covenant. <laughs> Amen. And that love covenant is absolutely perfect and flawless, you know. And so we need to know that the love covenant 
It's what God has given us, and He wants us to live by it. Amen. Now, let me just give you another little uh, portion over here in Psalms 91, which agrees exactly with what we're talking about, because you remember we talked about uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And, you know, and I've given you almost three witnesses for almost everything I've talked about, but I'm just going to give you another little additional thing here in Psalms 91. I just want to read uh, from verse 14. Psalm 91, verse 14. Notice we talked about nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now notice here in Psalms 91 and 14, it said, Because he has set his love upon me, this is God speaking in the first person here, because, and he's talking to whoever that does this, because he or she have set their love upon him, he said, I will set him on high or her on high. Well, that's one thing that's going to happen. That's what God's saying. You know, and if you look at some ministers that are really obeying God the way they should, uh, you know, they have position. People around them know that they have something to offer and they come to them all the time. To, you know, family members especially. You know, if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they always come to that person that uh, locked in with God and knows what God has for them, right? I remember years ago, uh, my uncle actually went to another church. I went to the Pentecostal Church of God at that time. And he went to another church. And in his church, you know, they didn't believe in the Holy Ghost, being filled with the Holy Ghost. They didn't believe in healing. They believe you had to pray if it, if it be God's will and that. Well, his daughter called him and said, Daddy, I'm dying of cancer. And he told her, said, Honey, you need to call. They call me Donnie in my hometown, my family, you know. Said, You need to call Donnie because he goes to that church that believes in healing. How about that? That was my uncle, see. Told his daughter, said, You call Donnie. And so I was brand new at this, had my little blue Bible in my back pocket and went over there. And just to make it really short, you know, when I went in the house, it was real gloomy. Uh, in a few minutes as I read some healing scripture to her, God completely healed that girl. And I walked out of there and it was like, the, went from gloomy to the whole house was lit up. And everybody was hugging and embracing me and loving on me, you know, because, hey, the kids, mama was healed. Uh, the husband's wife was healed. <laughs> you know what I mean? And my cousin was healed. See? And so we were all happy. Well, that's the blessing that comes. Yeah. So he goes on to say here, uh, he said, he, uh, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I missed that one, didn't I? I will deliver him. So if we need to be delivered or set free from like drugs or alcohol or anything, you know, some people get saved and uh, they, they're still smoking. Well, you can be delivered from that. Mm -hmm. Or they still have some bad habits or, uh, you know, doing some things they shouldn't be doing, you know. Well, you can get delivered from all of that. I remember years ago there was somebody that chewed tobacco or dipped snuff or something, you know. And uh, the minister said, well, you can be delivered from that. Say, well, you can. Then it goes on, it goes on to say, I will set him on high because he has known my name. Okay, well, you, uh, here it's uh, conditional to knowing the name of God, the know, name of Jesus, as we know it, see. David knew God's name. He, whenever he went against Goliath, he didn't uh, sit there and, you know, tell Goliath, well, I have a bigger sword than you and I have this and that. No. He said, you come against me with a sword and a shield. I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Amen? And the hosts are the angels. I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And of course, he took Goliath down, didn't he? Well, we may have some giants in our life that need to be taken down, right? Mm -hmm. See? How are we going to take them down? Well, we got the name. See? We are Christian. And Christian means Christ-like. 
I heard one minister say, you know, well, hardly any people in his church were Christ-like. Well, you know what my opinion of that is? Is the preacher's not preaching right. <laughs> See? Because if he preached right, they would be Christ-like, wouldn't they? Man, I remember a person that came to visit our church one time, many years ago, and he said, your church is the most mature church I've ever ministered in. Now, <laughs> I have to be honest with you. <laughs> I was just taking Dad Hagen's uh, teachings and teaching them over and over and over and over. And I needed to get it. The people needed to get it. We were all getting it. <laughs> See? Because I didn't have to say it. That man said it. He said this church is the most mature church he was in. And he said, I go into several churches all over the United States. And this is the most mature church I've been in. How about that? See, and like I said, I just did it with the word uh, that I learned. Amen? Now, Psalms, uh, Psalm 91, he said, I will deliver him. I will set him on high uh, because he hath known my name. Verse 15, he said, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. Well, that's just conditional to loving God. Uh, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. Then it said, I will be with him in trouble. So if we get into trouble, you know, well, he's going to be with us. He's never going to leave us nor forsake us, it tells us, tells us in Hebrews. Uh, <clears throat> now, he goes on to say, I will deliver him and honor him. I will deliver him and honor him. Well, when we get delivered, <laughs> you know, we're going to be honored in the eyes of man, but God's the one that's bringing the honor. See? Why? Because he's bringing the deliverance in our life to set us free right in the face of maybe something that looks like it's a total disaster. And I don't know how, I couldn't even tell you how many times God has delivered me even before I, uh, you know, walked with him the right way. I accepted the Lord in 1951 when I was in the Marine Corps and uh, several times I would hitchhike uh, home, you know, because I didn't have the money to pay for a bus ticket. And uh, I couldn't tell you all the wrong things I got into hitchhiking home. But, hey, God got me out of every one of them. One time, I got down too far on the on-ramp, and I was too close to the freeway, and the CHP came and picked me up and told me, he said, you can't be down there. <laughs> you have to stand up here on the street you know, you can't be down there. See, I wanted to be down there where all the cars were. <laughs> you know? But he said, you can't be down there. You have to wait until somebody comes down this ramp that's going to take you. And he said, but I'm going to take you to a safer place. So he didn't give me a ticket, but he told me, don't do that again, right? <laughs> he didn't give me a ticket, but he took me to a place where it was more of a highway and I could stay in a real safe place and people could see me and yet, I, you know, it wouldn't be dangerous for me to be there. Okay, so he helped me. But I believe that it was God that gave me favor with that man, you know, uh, to protect my life. So anyway, uh, let me just go over that. He said, I, uh, Therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Now look at verse 16. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Well, <laughs> long life. Amen. <laughs> well, thank God, you know, that God's lengthened my life. Uh, you know, my dad, uh, he didn't make it to 63, uh, pretty close to that. He was around, he was in his late uh, 62s, <laughs> you know. Uh, I had another uncle that died the same age as my dad. And my dad had three brothers, there's four of them. And then I had another uncle that died uh, when he was uh, 67 or 68. And then my grandfather he died when he was 68. Well, I'm 76. <laughs> and I'm still going. God's given me longevity. So I'm giving him all the glory. <laughs> Amen. I'm giving him all the glory. But again, this is how God wants us to know that he views us. He sees us this way. He sees us 
in a position so he can deliver us and help us and give us long and healthy and a prosperous life. Amen? Uh, John said in uh, 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prosper. Well, what does that mean? That means you have to get your mind renewed to the word of God. And uh, prosperity means continued success and continued well-being. <laughs> so there you have that one, real clean. It's what Jane used to say. There you have it, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's up to you. You can do what you want with it. But I'm telling you right now, God views you in a very special way. So go ahead and receive everything he has for you. Amen.